Good afternoon. Morning. <laughs> Don, you're always in a different time zone than everybody else. <laughs> well, I, I, I want to um, thank uh, everybody, welcome you to our second annual uh, lecture in the Richard and Ellen Sandor uh, Lecture Series on Medicine and Sustainability. Uh, we are thrilled to have Dr. Stephen Jackson here, uh, a world-renowned scientist uh, who will be speaking with us today. Dr. Jackson is Scientist Emeritus at the U.S. Geological Survey uh, and Professor Emeritus of Botany at the University of Wyoming, uh, where he was the founding director on the program in Ecology and Evolution. He will be speaking about climate biodiversity and people, actionable sciences in a post-normal world. Uh, before we begin, I think there's a CME slide somewhere. Uh, if you want to get CME credit for this, uh, please take time to register. Um, today's lecture is made possible by a generous gift uh, from the Richard and Ellen Sandor Family Foundation. Uh, we are very excited to have both the Sanders here with us today. Um, Richard uh, is a, a business person, an economist, an entrepreneur, and a very, very good friend. Uh, he uh, teaches in law and economics at the University of Chicago Law School uh, and is an honorary professor at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, in 2002, Time Magazine uh, named uh, he, uh, Richard the hero of the planet uh, for founding the Chicago Climate Exchange. Richard is chair and CEO of the American Financial Exchange and CEO of Environmental Financial Products. Uh, Ellen is a new media artist uh, and founding director of the Chicago-based collective of artists, scientists, mathematicians, and computer experts. She has works in the permanent collections of the Smithsonian Institute, the International Center of Photography, uh, the Santa Barbara Museum of Art, and others. Uh, she's an advisory board chair of the Gene Siskel Film Center, uh, is on the board of governors of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, uh, and is life trustee emeritus of the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, the Sandors uh, have a special place in the hearts of us at UAMS, not only for their generosity in supporting this uh, lecture series, but also uh, in other ways as well. Uh, recall that the first lecture uh, in this series was on March 31st, uh, 2023. Uh, we all remember that day because of the tornado that came through Little Rock and left uh, tremendous devastation. Um, the Sanders noticed this, and out of uh, their generosity, um, they provided uh, funds for groceries uh, and supplies for our UAMS employees who were dislocated because of the tornado. Um, we cannot thank you enough for what you did to our family members that day. Now, it is my honor to introduce Dr. Stephen Jackson. Throughout his career, Dr. Jackson's scientific research has focused on using the past 25,000 years of Earth history as a source of natural experiments to explore ecological responses to environmental changes of various kinds, rates, and magnitudes. In the past two decades, his professional efforts have expanded to include natural, research, natural resource conservation uh, and climate change adaptation. His interests also include the history of science, and he has edited two English translations of classic works by Alexander von Humboldt, with the third nearing completion. I know you're all anxious uh, to hear his presentation, so I will be quiet. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen Jackson. Yes, thank you. Uh, um, yeah, I, I really appreciate the invitation to come here and speak. It's, it's of course, always a little bit intimidating to speak to an audience that's mostly people who aren't my direct colleagues. But um, I've spent pretty much all my career crossing disciplinary boundaries. And the more of it I do, the more rewarding and insightful it gets. And um, uh, I've... Uh, some of my, what I consider to be my most important contributions have come from ideas that I've poached or pilfered or purloined from uh, other disciplines, uh, including the medical sciences. I'll come to that towards the end of my, uh, my talk. And so in a way I see this as a, as a way of paying back 
to uh, hopefully be able to provide some ideas and insights from the areas that I've been working with that might be useful to, uh, to all of you in your, your professional and personal lives. So um, I just wanna start out with some very broad reflections. We live on a highly dynamic planet. Uh, the, this figure shows the last 66 million years of earth history uh, and the the y-axis is temperature, and you can see that uh, the the x-axis, the time scale, is actually a log scale, which may be a little bit uh, uh, takes some getting used to. But you can see overall that there has been a trend for the past six to six million years towards global cooling. Uh, things were much much hotter in the Paleocene and Eocene. And they've, uh, they've undergone cooling with some return intervals and some warm uh, intervals uh, until about uh, 2 million years ago when we hit the, the Pleistocene and uh, things got very wobbly. So for the past 2 million years, we've been going through these glacial interglacial cycles. We've just been through about the 20th uh, major swing from uh, a, uh, a largely ice-free climate, except at the, at the poles and uh, the polar regions, uh, to um, ice covered uh, for much of the, um, the high and, and even mid latitudes. Uh, just to put some perspective on it, uh, our genus, Homo, has only been around for the past 2 million years. We've only been around during those, uh, these relatively cool and very wobbly phases of Earth history. We missed, or at least our, our ancestors didn't, but our genus missed this very warm period uh, up, at, up at the front. Uh, Homo sapiens, our species, has only been around for about a quarter million to maybe 300,000 years. So it's really only, we've only experienced as a species the last three or maybe two and a half of the glacial interglacial cycles. This is on a, um, uh, this just shows the last four, uh, 450,000 years. Uh, and here we are in the present interglacial a mere 20,000 years ago. Um, there were ice sheets on top of Chicago and Des Moines and Indianapolis and on the, in the suburbs of Cincinnati. Uh, and uh, the last interglacial was about 100 to 110,000 years ago. So we've been going from glacial to interglacial, to, or uh, rather um, the last interglacial was um, uh, about uh, 110,000 years ago. So we've been going from interglacial to glacial to interglacial uh, back and forth. Um, and these have been driven largely by changes, uh, these, these longer term changes, or these longer term uh, uh, climate changes, these have been driven primarily by tectonic changes, by continental drift and changes in their, their effects on ocean circulation and atmospheric circulation. Uh, carbon dioxide uh, and methane have, all, have also played important roles in some very slow dynamics of the geochemistry of the, of the oceans and the atmosphere and the lithosphere. Uh, these glacial interglacial fluctuations have been driven primarily by orbital forcing, which are changes in uh, the Earth's orientation in its rotation uh, around the sun that results in seasonal and latitudinal changes in the, or changes in the seasonal, lat seasonal and latitudinal distribution of, uh, of solar radiation. And that's what's been driving these glacial interglacial cycles. And you can see that July insulation uh, in green and January insulation in purple have been varying, but not co-varying necessarily. They, they're doing their own independent thing in response to these celestial mechanical drivers. And that's largely what's been driving the, uh, the glacial interglacial cycles, but carbon dioxide also plays an important role during the glacial periods. A lot of the carbon dioxide uh, the, the carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere go down because it's getting buried in uh, the oceans, in uh, carbonate sediments of the oceans uh, and other places. And uh, each deglaciation, there's usually a burst of carbon dioxide, which accelerates the, uh, the transition from glacial to, uh, uh, to interglacial. 
So again, climate changes, uh, again, uh, in these longer time scales due to plate tectonics, due to the celestial mechanics, uh, these interactions of, uh, of some of the more powerful greenhouse gases, volcanic emissions play a role at both short and long-term scales. Solar variations play a role. Another one that we're probably all familiar with or that we at least experience are dynamics or complex interactions in ocean and atmospheric circulation that are caused by the changes in the distribution of heat and sometimes materials, uh, particularly salt in the, uh, in the oceans. Uh, that, uh, that, that change and affect both oceanic circulation and atmospheric circulation that has big effects on our weather and our climate. These are things, probably the most familiar one is El Nino Southern Oscillation. I live in the Southwest. We're just coming out of a fairly, uh, actually a very strong El Nino winter. We had a lot of snow, a lot of precipitation in the Southwest. You probably saw the news stories about the atmospheric rivers hitting California and, and creating floods and so forth. Um, so uh, other ones are, you know, there, there are any number of these different kinds of, uh, of oscillations and they all interact with each other. Uh, uh, and they're driven largely by these dynamics of heat transfer in the oceans, heat transfer be, uh, be, or heat movement in the oceans, heat transfer between the oceans and the atmosphere, but also the cryosphere, uh, the ice sheets uh, play some role in it, and the land surface uh, interacts with it in very complex ways. And this is what gives us this kind of thing. This is a tree ring record from the central Mississippi Valley, mostly uh, bald cypresses in uh, eastern or uh, yeah, eastern Ar Arkansas in the Delta region, and junipers in the Missouri Ozarks and some of the other uh, some of the Arkansas mountains. And again, you can see a lot of uh, variation in uh, effective moisture over the past 800 years, with uh, with wet periods, dry periods long wet periods, long dry periods, mega droughts, and, and so forth. And these are largely driven, uh, there's some volcanic influence here and there, but these are largely driven by the interactions of these kinds of circulation patterns. So um, climate changes, and as climate changes, ecosystems change. And I'll just give you one example. I could uh, go on with hundreds of these, but I won't. This one's uh, from not too far away. This is uh, a little sinkhole pond uh, in the, the Missouri uh, Ozark Plateau, just across the, uh, the Missouri line uh, in the 11 point current river country. Uh, it's, uh, we, uh, a few years ago, we got a sediment core from this sinkhole. Um, the regional vegetation is oak pine forest, although the sinkhole has a, a little disjunct population of tupelo gum. Uh, but uh, the surrounding uplands are oak pine forest, very similar to the kind of vegetation you'd see in the, in the mountains just north and west of Little Rock. So this is the, the record, the stratigraphic record that we have from that pond. Uh, uh, the youngest at the top, oldest at the bottom, it goes from uh, the present to 20,000 years ago. And these marks represent uh, different amounts of pollen from various plants in the surrounding landscape that have collected in the, the sediments of, these, uh, of this pond. And uh, looking at the first phase of this, the oldest phase, 20,000 to 16,000 years ago, the vegetation is very different. There was a lot of pine, but it was not yellow pine or shortleaf pine, the kind that you have uh, in the region today. It was jack pine, which is a boreal species. You'd have to go, uh, the nearest populations are on the southern shore of Lake Michigan, but you'd have to go deep into Michigan or Wisconsin to even find more than a few scattered trees. And if you wanted to find a jack pine forest, you'd have to go up to the Canadian Shield. Uh, the other co-dominant during this period was spruce. So we've got essentially boreal forest with spruce and jack pine in the Missouri Ozarks. Um, things were colder back then. Again, this is when two mile, a two mile thick ice sheet was just a few hundred miles north of the Ozarks. Uh, now, as the ice retreated, uh, as things warmed up during a very rapid 
for geologically speaking, uh, deglaciation, uh, there was very rapid ecological turnover. In this phase, there's a lot happening. I won't go through all the details, but you can see uh, the spruce goes down, the boreal pine goes down, oak increases, and in, then you get a whole bunch of, uh, of things that uh, you're probably more familiar with from this region, like ash and uh, hickory and hazelnut and, and so forth. Um, about 10,000 years ago, we transitioned into a relatively stable period that uh, where the Ozarks were predominantly oak savanna, not oak forest like you'd see today, but rather open oak woodland or open oak savanna. Um, I don't have it in this diagram, but there we find a lot of charcoal in there. So there was a lot of fire uh, on the landscape at that time. Uh, the high grass pollen and ragweed pollen, again, indicates the open nature of this vegetation. The pines only showed up about 1,800 years ago. Uh, and um, the uh, and that's also when the canopy closed, when we start losing the grass pollen. Um, and so what we've got is this sequence of, uh, of vegetational changes, sequence of ecological changes as the climate changes, possibly with human activities involved here and indigenous fire practices may have played some role, but that was probably related to some of the climate changes uh, that they were experiencing and adapting to. But this, the ecosystem that we're familiar with in uh, the Ozarks and probably the Wachita's and the Boston Mountains is a young ecosystem. It's only been around for a couple thousand years at most. Um, and it turns out that most ecosystems really aren't terribly old by these kinds of standards. There are some that uh, this is just a, uh, a grab bag compilation uh, that I put together a few years ago, but uh, just to show some representative examples that some ecosystems have only been around in their present state for a few decades or a couple of centuries. Others have been around for a thousand years, others for two or 3000 years, others for 5000 years, but very few ecosystems in North America go back more than about 10,000, 11,000 years. Uh, before, if you go to that same place, before 10,000, 11,000 years ago, there was something very different on the ground then. And this is a product of these longer term climate changes. Um, I was interested in the question of, is this global? Uh, you know, does this happen everywhere? And so we got a group of about 30, 35 scientists from uh, paleoecologists from all over the, over the world to do a grand compilation of the records we have from the last glacial maximum and compare them with the present. And it turns out that nearly everywhere, um, vegetation is turned over, that, that what is growing on the ground in the past few thousand years is very different from what was there at the last glacial maximum. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether you're in the polar regions or the tropics. It doesn't matter whether you're on the coast or in the mountains. This is pretty much a universal phenomenon. So change is very normal. Uh, Climate-driven change uh, ecologically is very normal. So, Climate changes, ecosystems change. What's the problem? Why are we worrying about climate change? Um, we are we're in a uh, we're in a period where since the industrial revolution, we've been on a steady march of increase in carbon dioxide that has not tapered off, um, and uh, carbon dioxide is a powerful greenhouse gas. There are also other greenhouse gases, methane, which is even more powerful than carbon dioxide, that are these changes in atmospheric chemistry, although very proportionally very small as a proportion of the atmosphere, they have big amplifying effects on the climate. And so this is ultimately what's underlying what we're experiencing, which is global warming. And the reasons to worry about this are many. Um, this is a simult, what we're going into is a period, or what we're in actually is a period where we have simultaneously um, high rate and potentially high magnitude climate change happening at a global scale. 
And this is very unusual. We haven't seen anything like this in the past 10,000 years, uh, which is the period in which agriculture developed and flourished. It's the period in which civilizations developed. Um, and global temperatures could well, on, according to the worst case projections, which are not out of the question, global temperatures could go well beyond our experience as a species or even are experienced as a genus by the end of the century, just 20 or just 75 years from now. Um, when climate changes, there are casualties. Um, and so the last rapid warming we had, which was not uh, uniformly global, and it wasn't as big and as rapid as the one that we're in now, but there were changes uh, dur uh, during that rapid warming of the deglaci the, the, the last deglaciation, there were casualties, there were extinctions, uh, like the Irish elk, uh, like uh, Fitchfield spruce, which grew, uh, it's been documented in Memphis and down in, uh, in the Baton Rouge area and elsewhere in the Southeast. It was a dominant tree species 20,000 years ago and it vanished uh, sometime around 13,000 years ago. Other species went through near extinction events. Uh, they have uh, genetic evidence for extreme genetic bottlenecks. So things like cheetahs, um, tory pines, red pines, moose, very familiar species have limited genetic diversity. In fact, um, red pine, uh, which you'd see if you went up into the Great Lakes, a very widespread species has almost no significant genetic diversity in it. It went through a very severe bottleneck that it's come out of and it hasn't developed its genetic diversity uh, back again. So there are big consequences there. There are consequences for society. Again, in the last 10,000 years, we haven't seen anything like we're, what we're facing now. And yet severe decadal to multi-decadal droughts have caused civilizations to collapse. Uh, and vanish complex agriculture and urban agricultural and urban societies in the Middle East, uh, in the American Southwest, uh, in um, the Mississippi Valley, um, in uh, uh, the the Cahokian culture, and many other parts of the world. Uh, there are entire civilizations that have collapsed. The people are still there. But not, uh, but only in remnants and only in fragments. Their their uh, societies basically collapsed, and they had to change their their ways, adapt uh, in in different ways, and and reform in very different kinds of of configurations. Another issue with climate change is environmental novelty. We're not only going into never before experienced or not recently experienced global temperatures or even local temperatures, but we're going into territory where the combination of different biologically and uh, ecologically and medically important environmental variables are changing. Climate is multivariate. Um, this is a result of a very simplistic analysis that involved analysis that involved just four variables. January temperature means July temperature means January precipitation means July temperature uh, or January or yeah July precipitation means, and as a result of this, so it's a very conservative analysis. There are a lot more variables we could have put in, but over much of the world, um, the uh, we see novel climates, combinations of those four variables appearing, combinations that you can't go anywhere on the planet today and find. Those, you know, that particular combination of uh, seasonal precipitation and seasonal temperatures and other modern combinations from the 20th century that vanish uh, uh, in, in different places. If we used more variables, we'd probably paint much more of the, the, the planet red. So new climate realizations that we have no experience with emerging existing climate realizations that we're familiar with, that we know how to work with, that we know how to plan for, we know how to build infrastructure for, will disappear. And um, so this means there are gonna be all kinds of surprises in store. Uh, just speaking environmentally, novel ecosystems that we have never seen before, novel combinations of species uh, in different abundances are going to, uh, to appear. Species 
are going to be on the move. They're going to be adjusting their ranges as these uh, climate variables change. Some species populations are going to expand. Some of them are going to decline. There are going to be novel hydrologies, uh, which will affect things like seasonal water supplies, whether for plants and animals or for human societies. Uh, different pathogens and pests will emerge. Uh, invasive species will uh, will increase and, spe and spread as a as a result of that. So we got a lot of a lot of surprises in store for us. Uh, some of my colleagues call this not global warming but global weirding because we are going into a world that we really have no experience with. So as a famous philosopher said, the future ain't what it used to be, uh, or it ain't gonna be what it used to be. Let's say. So, and all of those phenomena that I just described are happening already. We are seeing them on the ground. There, there's increasing recognition over the past couple of decades that, wow, this stuff, we're, 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 we're in a changing world. Uh, and all of those kinds of things are, are happening. Uh, I want to pause just to give a couple of definitions, uh, which will become important later. In climate change science, um, there's a general consensus around the term climate mitigation. And climate mitigation is basically measures that we take as a society or as a nation or as a region, active measures that we take to intervene to reduce greenhouse gas emissions or enhance greenhouse gas sinks. So these include things like carbon capture and burial. They include things like decarbonization of the economy and changing uh, changes in our uh, transportation system. Uh, the other term is climate adaptation. Uh, and climate adaptation arises from the recognition that climate's already changing and we got to deal with it. So it's basically figuring out how we adjust to the ongoing or anticipated climate change effects. That's climate adaptation is really where I've been spending most of my time and energy for the past 15 years, uh, partly because uh, I felt I could do more in that area than mitigation. My expertise is more relevant to climate adaptation, and it's really, really urgent. We should have been getting on this. You know, I, I wish we'd been getting on this 30 or 50 years ago. We've got a lot of catching up to do. So it's something that's, uh, that's very important. But both are really important. We can adapt all we want, but if we don't mitigate, things are going to get worse. And we'll have more adapting to do, and the, adapt the adaptation will be become more difficult. So they aren't mutually exclusive. They go hand in hand. We really have to, uh, to do mitigation as well. But the rest of my talk, I'm going to be concentrating entirely on adaptation. So uh, just over 30 years ago, a, a, social, a sociologist and a political scientist published a paper about science for the post-normal age. And uh, they noted that uh, normal science, the kind of science that I was trained to do, that probably many of, of you were trained to do, I still do some, is normal is is where the uncertainties are relatively low and the decision stakes for society are relatively low so i can play in paleoecology all i want to and there there are actually really big uncertainties but it doesn't matter that much societally speaking uh with with that if i if i'm wrong the consequences aren't aren't terribly big but when you get into situations where both the scientific uncertainty is high and the decision stakes, the societal stakes are high, then you, uh, these guys argued that you are in post-normal science and the kinds of ways we go about science and the ways in which scientific research and the scientific community interact with the broader society must change in order to be successful, in order for science to serve uh, the, the societies that we live in, and that the rules really change in post-normal science. So I'll have some examples and more to say about that. So, you know, here's an example. This is, this is a photograph taken uh, off of my back deck in the COVID summer of 2020. Um, these are the Santa Catalina Mountains uh, in the background, uh, parts of Tucson, Arizona in the, in the middle ground. And that big cloud up there is a pyrocumulus cloud formed by a fire that rampaged across the mountain range up and down, back and forth for more than a month. 
Uh, it burned 120,000 acres all the way from the pine forests at the summits down to the desert, uh, the arid desert scrub, right down to the edge of the suburbs. <clears throat> So there's a question now in the, you know, this was a very severe, very large fire. Um, lots of those kinds of fires are happening now in the West. What do we do post fire? If you were a forest manager or a wildlife manager, what do you do in the post fire recovery? Well, in normal times, back in the 20th century, we would just rely on, we'd mobilize our natural processes to help restore to the ecosystem to its historical state. You know, maybe give it a nudge here, an intervention there to help it along, but at least we'd be confident that we could get it back to what it was before the fire. But we're in post normal times. That fire was followed immediately by an utter failure of the annual summer monsoon. It was the second driest summer on record immediately following that fire. The next two summers were also monsoon failures. So we had three, uh, or no, I'm sorry, the, the next three winters were La Nina winters, which are also very dry. So we had a, an unusually dry summer followed by three exceptionally dry winters. Those are the two dr wet seasons, are late summer and, and on through the winter. This is on top of persistent drought in the region that's been happening for uh, since 1999 uh, with a few little precipitation uh, peaks, but mostly mostly dry. For the past couple of decades, we are breaking temperature records in all seasons uh, and always on the high end. Uh, and the fire mortality was, was extensive and severe. So there's a real question of whether we can ever restore these forests to what they were before. So what's a manager to do? They can try to actively restore to the pre-fire state. They can just live with whatever happens afterwards, which may be a novel ecosystem, or you know, maybe they can redirect ecological processes towards something that's not like the historical state, but might be at least okay, uh, at least desirable. Um, those questions are laden with science and laden with scientific uncertainties which I'll unpack momentarily. And they're also value laden because these are decisions that have consequences for society, not only for the recreation and the wildlife management and so forth in these mountains, but also for the hydrology, for uh, 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 flood control and uh, risk reduction in floods, for water supply to the city of Tucson and some of the surrounding communities uh, and, and so forth. So we're in post-normal times here. One of the things that we're, we're seeing now um, all over the Southwest uh, and uh, thank you, um, all over the Southwest and in fact, all over the West from Alaska down deep into Mexico and also elsewhere in the world is ecosystem transformation. So this photograph is from the Santa Rita Mountains, which is uh, about 30 miles south of the Santa Catalinas. This is what uh, over to the left is what the entire foreground and midground used to look like. It was mature, old growth, Douglas fir and Arizona pine forest, lovely open stands of, uh, of, of forest that got burned severely in a 2005 fire. Over here, you can see all of the skeletons of the trees that are still standing. And the green stuff you see here those aren't baby pines or baby firs. Those are oaks. They're a shrubby oak species that maybe, you know, at maturity, they get up to my hip or maybe my shoulder. But this is a net conversion, uh, in ir probably irreversible conversion from forest to shrubland, which has very different properties. It's much hotter. You don't have any shade there to walk around in. Um, it has very different um, uh, hydrological properties, reflective properties, uh, recreational properties, et cetera, et cetera. And these are the kinds of conversions, 20 years later, this is, this is what this looks like now. And these kinds of conversions, with particularly with these severe wildfires, are happening all over the West. This is a compilation where we got a group of about 50 
uh, scientists and resource managers from these four states together to just compare notes and map out where we're seeing these kinds of transformations. They're all over the place, in, uh, particularly in forests, but we're also seeing them in grasslands, in sagebrush steppe, in uh, woodlands, in, in chaparral, and, and elsewhere. So this is a, this is a coming thing. This is a, this is a wave that we're just starting to hit and trying to, to come to grips with. So um, ecosystem transformations are in store just about everywhere. Uh, again, the climate projections uh, and ecological projections indicate that this is something that's happening. I think one important thing here is that the more temperature change, the more the likelihood of conversion of uh, ecosystem transformation. So it actually, this is where mitigation does matter because the less we mitigate, the bigger this problem becomes. So, you know, we wanna know, well, what, what will be the outcomes? What can we manage for? Forecasting ecological futures under climate change is not rocket science. It's a lot, lot harder. It's really, really hard for reasons I'll unpack. And I think that public health has a lot of similarity to this. Um, if you want to understand what controls a species range or the composition of uh, an ecological community or the structure and function of an ecosystem, there are three primary loci that you have to consider. One is the organism's response to the physical environment, the climate, the soil, the uh, microclimate, and so forth. Uh, you've got lots of species interactions, uh, and this, so you have to take this, those into account because the species interactions will uh, affect the, uh, the overall outcome. And you also have contingent events. Ecological systems have memory. They remember things, sometimes for years, sometimes for decades, sometimes for centuries or more. Um, and so those contingent events matter. Climate changes or, or climate affects each of these directly, and it also affects how they interact with each other. So uh, just to unpack this a little bit, let's take, we have thousands of species that we're trying to understand. Or let's say we've just got an ecosystem with five species five plant species, um, they're likely to have different responses to temperature or any other climate variable. What's temperature? To a plant, here's a partial list of the ways that temperature, that a plant might respond to temperature, to, to air temperature, let's say. Um, and they get more complex as you go in, more subtle and more boutique as you go down. But plants and animals in the wild are very boutique. They've got very, uh, they've got uh, uh, some very specialized sensitivities. Most of them really don't care about mean annual temperature. They care more about some of these really um, uh, more subtle and more specific kinds of, uh, of, uh, of temperature variables. So temperature is not simple. And understanding organismal responses to temperature is not simple. Another of the challenges is an environmental novelty. So this um, picture shows, um, yeah, you can see it in the gray. Sometimes the gray doesn't show up on the screen. That The gray and black there represents the climate of North America. Those are individual gridded data points showing the mean January and mean July temperature in North America, all the way from uh, Mexico up into the Arctic area. The black dots represent places where ash trees grow, things like white ash that you'd see up here in the Ozarks uh, or pumpkin ash uh, down in the valley. The problem is that as climate changes, these points are gonna move around. And they're not all going to move around within this environmental space. Some of them, and probably a lot of them, are going to be moving outside that ellipse. And under the current forecasts, by uh, another 50 years, a lot of those points are going to be out here where the question marks are. We have no empirical basis for knowing what ash trees are going to do in that space. 
um, you know, they're, 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 that space doesn't exist in the real world. We might be able to recreate it in the laboratory and do some experiments, but we can't do that for several thousand species. So this is a big source of uncertainty. Uh, just in the environmental domain. Biotic interactions, there are tons of those. Uh, uh, climate change is going to affect uh, native competitors and invasive competitors, native and invasive dispersers and consumers, native and invasive pests and pathogens, mutualists, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a source of complexity. And another one goes back to this, uh, this memory, ecological memory issue that um, many ecological outcomes are historically contingent. There are different kinds of inertias and legacies and anachronisms in ecosystems today. And a lot of these have to do with this mid-range climate variability at uh, annual and decadal and centennial scales. Here, this graph has moved to the uh, to the uh, the Rocky Mountain and Colorado Plateau region. Represents the last 1,200 years in the Upper Colorado River Basin. The, the main point here is again, there's been a lot of uh, variation in precipitation. The variation is non-stationary. This isn't just, you can't model this as random fluctuations around a changing mean. The mean and the variance are drifting and changing as a result of these complex interactions between the oceans and atmosphere and land surface. And so it matters ecologically if a severe drought is followed by a very short wet period or by a longer wet period or by a period of kind of, you know, bouncing around the average or, or average conditions. You'll get different ecological outcomes uh, under each of those kinds of circumstances. And this is something that is very difficult to forecast. Uh, the climatologists I talk to say that these, uh, these interactions are so complex that they really do not see a way forward in robust forecasting at the time scales of a few years to a couple of decades out. Uh, in contrast to their confidence about weather forecasting, which we do really well, and their confidence about the, uh, uh, the forecasting of, uh, of conditions uh, 50 or more years out. So one of the things that uh, you know, can give me a real headache here is that uh, multiple realizations multiple ecological realizations in the same place are possible under a similar out average future climate. Even if you can perfectly uh, and robustly characterize the climate of a place 50 or 100 years out, you don't you can't have as much confidence in predicting what the ecosystem is going to look like because there are so many of these path dependencies in ecology and so many divergent directions that are going to depend on that mid-range variability in the climate system, which is really hard to predict. So this is a really, really hard problem because uh, uh, we, we need something to plan with. Managing under change is the conservation challenge of the century, in my view. Um, it's, as I've noted, it's highly uncertain. It's value-laden, context-specific. The targets are moving, and it's culturally constrained by any number of, uh, of factors. So this is going to be a really big challenge for resource managers. One of the uh, things we're, we're currently as a community trying to figure out, well, what do we do? What, uh, you know, how do, how do we manage in the face of some of these uncertainties? This is a small step, but a very important step forward that came out of discussions in 2019 and 2020 among a group of uh, scientists or a bunch of, or a group of ecological researchers, uh, as well as a number of managers and uh, policymakers, civil service policymakers, uh, where, uh, we recognize that there are really three things. If, you, if you've got a system that's changing, there are three things you can do. You can resist change, try to keep it in its historical window. You can accept the change and just live with whatever comes, or you can try to direct the change and nudge it towards an outcome that's going to be desirable or at least not too undesirable. Um, 
Resistance is easy because you've got clear and discrete targets, the historical states, it involves ecosystems that we've been working with in management for the past uh, several decades or even centuries, but it's hard because it requires actions and interventions, and the more the climate changes, the more severe and expensive the actions and interventions have to be become, and ultimately, you're going to fail. It may be worth doing for a while to buy you time to come up with something better, but eventually, if things keep on changing, the system will collapse and it will go over into some other state. Acceptance is easy because you don't have to do much. You don't have to make hard decisions. You just let it roll. Uh, but you you can't you aren't always sure of what you're going to get, and for sure you may not like what you wind up getting. So sometimes. We have to do this, and managers are already doing this just by default because they ha they don't have the resources to deal with this. But um, in I, you know I think in some cases we're going to regret that inaction now. Direction directed change is easy because oh wait it's not easy it's not easy at all uh, it because it forces us to think about what's important and what's attainable and how to get there. And that is very, very difficult. Uh, directed change is an intentional deviation from historical norms. And those historical norms and natural states are really deeply baked into conservation and resource management. There's a lot of resistance uh, among managers, although that's cracking very rapidly because managers are realizing that resistance is becoming futile in a lot of cases, but we have legal and policy resistances that constrain us within that box. Uh, and also we, we value these old growth forests and these historical systems. They have heritage value for us uh, and, and uh, aesthetic and often ethical values and religious values. Um, it also, so directed change is hard for that reason. Uh, it puts us in the position of management uncertainties because we are creating novel ecosystems that we have no experience in managing. So we've got to figure that out. And we have to adjudicate different values and those values are frequently going to be in conflict. So this is, this is not easy stuff, uh, but there are a lot of people in these communities who are now talking about it and trying to figure out uh, how, to, how to do this. One good thing I'll just bring in, this is where paleoecology can, can help a little bit, because knowing that this region was different 2,000 years ago and really different 10,000 years ago helps us think about a future that's different from what our recent experience is. So it's kind of a, I, I use it as a gateway drug for managers to think about how your system might legitimately be different from the historical state. And it's really good, I think, as a way to help people visualize something different from what they've been used to uh, historically. So these uncertainties are going to remain deep and persistent. Uh, I want to transition very quickly and have say a few words about biodiversity and climate change and public health. Um, all of these biodiversity dynamics and ecosystem transformations being driven by climate change and other factors have consequences for human health and well-being. Um, the uh, uh, you know pathogens, they're part of biodiversity, like it or not. Um, many, I, I think the most recent figure I've seen is uh, about 60% of infectious diseases are zoonotic in origin. They, they originated ultimately in reservoirs of, of, uh, of wild populations of, of birds and mammals. Uh, animals, I uh, think mosquitoes and ticks are major transmission vectors and airborne diseases like valley fever, waterborne diseases, like all the different kinds of things that, um, that uh, we've seen in, in the, the warmer states, uh, including I'm sure Arkansas, are all affected by climate and ecosystem states. Uh, and so uh, there are big implications for what we're doing or for what, what's happening with respect to um, public health. Um, we're, we've seen globally recent outbreaks in dengue, in Zika virus, in cholera that seem to be at least partly related to climate change. Vectors are on their move and they're taking their pathogens. Uh, just the reason I put up this picture was uh, this is a, a, a 
forest, uh, a wilderness area in Southern Indiana, where just a month ago, I had my first lifetime encounter with a, um, a Lone Star Tick, which I had never seen before in my life. And I spent the first 30 years of my life tromping through forests exactly like this, collecting all kinds of ticks, but they were all wood ticks. Uh, Lone Star Ticks have moved north into that region, and the wood ticks I was familiar with, who my friends in college from Chicago had never seen before they moved to Carbondale for, to go to college, now those wood ticks are up by Lake Superior, and people are getting Lyme disease all the way up into the upper peninsula of Michigan. So these things are on the move. Reservoir species are on the move, uh, and with climate-driven ecological change and increasing human encroachment, uh, both locally, regionally, and globally, there's an increasing exposure, increasing risk of pathogen crossover. So there have been assertions that a warmer world will be a sicker world. I don't know. I'm, you know, my my ecologist says we can't really predict this. That at least we, in general, it's going to be the devil is going to be in the details. It's going to be really hard to make generalizations. What I am pretty confident about saying is that there are going to be continual emergences of new diseases and expansions of existing diseases as a result of climate change. But there may be some places where we'll get wins out of the climate change, uh, that, uh, that climate change may actually be bad for some diseases and, and make the, the, the control a little, bit, uh, a little bit easier. But again, um, it's, it's going to be complex and generalizations are going to be hard human actions are going to play a huge role here, as they will in the ecological systems. Uh, what we do as individuals, as societies, as economies, as nations, are going to matter very, very greatly in, uh, in, this, uh, in this particular space. Um, one thing I want to just leave you with is if you're interested in this and it's new territory uh, for you. There's a, the One Health Initiative, which is coming out of the United Nations, but has been adopted by CDC. So if you go to the CDC website, you'll find a web, uh, a One Health landing page, a number of other um, uh, Department of Interior Management and Science Agencies and uh, uh, NOAA uh, have all, uh, are all getting involved in this. And the idea is that human health um, and animal health and ecological health are all intricately related, recognizing these kinds of relationships we've just des been describing. Um, that, uh, uh, so I think if, if you're interested in this, this is a very good place to start. Um, so one final thing, I, I wanna close with just some talk uh, a little bit about uh, where I borrowed from the medical science community, uh, translational science, and the great gap between the communities of research and the communities of decision and practice. So um, I've, I spent much of my career standing on this cliff, yelling across to those managers, hey, you know, there are problems here. You need to pay attention to what we're doing with the science. And I had lots of help. I mean, there, I was part of a, a, a chorus of hundreds, thousands of scientists saying, let's do something. And we used the loading dock model for our published papers on the dock and let them take it over. We used the megaphone model, hoping that if we talked louder, they'd understand us better. We used the authority model that we're scientists and we know what we're doing and you just need to listen and do what we tell you to do. We tried the packaging model of, you know, putting bells and whistles on stuff. And if we could only find the perfect graphic to portray this, people will pay attention. But I learned much to my embarrassment and relatively late in my career that this stuff doesn't work very well. And it's not nearly as effective as sitting and listening and having conversations uh, with the decision makers uh, and with the, the resource managers. So a post-normal world requires that we, re as Funtowicz and Rivets indicated 30 years ago, a post-normal world requires that we renegotiate this whole relationship between researchers and decision makers. And that's what's happening 
uh, in, in ecology now. Uh, I think medical sciences discovered this a little bit before we did. Uh, borrowing from that, again, one of the ideas I poached reading about translational medicine was realizing we needed translational ecology. So uh, I got together with a couple of colleagues. We assembled a group of about 30, 35 researchers, decision makers and social scientists to just sit down and try to figure this out. And if you're interested, there's a special issue of this journal. If you Google translational ecology frontiers, volume 15, you'll, you'll find it. And there may be some stuff useful, there may not be, but I think we, we do have some things that might be useful as uh, uh, to, to feedback to the uh, medical science community. So in that spirit, I just wanna, close with this question, are we being good ancestors from Jonas Salk? I think that's what we should all be asking ourselves, regardless of our discipline right now. Um, I, want, I, I am hoping that in my counterparts and resource managers and uh, decision makers 50 years from now or 100 years from now will look back at what I've done and what we as a, a, a group have done and say, boy, I'm glad they did that. They did the right thing. Or at very least won't be cursing us. Um, so I, I think we need to be thinking forward about, are we being good ancestors? Uh, I, uh, I wish all of us luck uh, in this enterprise. There are gonna be successes, there are gonna be failures. We need to learn from the failures and pick up and keep on moving. So thank you. Yeah, Kim. So first of all, I want to point out Jonas Salk. Mm -hmm. uh, you talk about being good ancestors. Um, he was not wearing gloves as he was in Judea. <laughs> <laughs> True. Um, but you didn't say anything about um, scientific misinformation as you were talking about, you know, how we, how you are influencers. And I wondered if you could just uh, speak to that because that seems like it's going up in the same direction as CO2 is. Yeah, no, that, that, that's a really good point, Cam. And, and um, uh, that, that's, a, that's a major frustration because it's, I, I've been seeing it happening since the 1980s and it's, it's getting worse, it's getting louder and it's getting more sophisticated. And um, uh, I, uh, that was one of the reasons, that, and partly this is my own temperament, I, I was at a branch point, kind of like this one, where I was either gonna put my emphasis into mitigation or put my emphasis into adaptation. And mitigation would have taken me down a path where I'd have to do more of that, dealing with that kind of, um, uh, that, that kind of conversation, which, you know, there, there are people who are much, temperamentally much better suited to those interactions than, than I am. Um, and, um, it, it requires a lot of patience, but also uh, sometimes patience, to, you know, sometimes it's one, the conversations about these kinds of things are impossible with certain groups and audiences. So I chose the adaptation route. Again, temperament, my expertise was more relevant to that. And also I felt that with, with adaptation, this is one of the reasons I, I left uh, the university and went to USGS was I felt that um, by talking with land managers and wildlife managers who tend to be fairly conservative, uh, I mean, as a, as, a, as a group, I think, you know, again, generation, generationally, it may be changing, but there are, um, there was a lot of resistance in that community, a lot of resistance in the, in the ranching community, a lot of resistance in the water management community to the ideas of climate change. And climate adaptation gives, it provides a space that you can actually talk about climate and build up some trust and explore the consequences and not even talk about carbon dioxide, not even talk about the, you know, the IPCC projections or whatever, but just to say, okay, well, what if it gets hotter? Or in the case of um, the hydrological community, really uh, 
got serious about climate change in the early 2000s. One of my grad students was, was uh, one of the first to really engage with that, along with a, a couple of people at University of Arizona, where they, they showed some of those tree ring diagrams of the last thousand years of hydrological variability in the upper Colorado or the North Platte or various other river systems, and then compared them with the range of variability over the past century within the instrumental record, and just told the water managers, here's what can happen under natural conditions, under natural variability. And it really, it got their attention and the much of the water resource management community from the Southwest all the way up to the Canadian border, and I'm sure beyond in the West, they're looking at things very differently. And now they're really paying attention to climate change because they're, they're in the Colorado River Basin. They're seeing that that river system is not what it was in the 20th century. And, um, you know, it would take 20 wet consecutive winters to bring it back to anything like the, that, uh, that century. So I think, I guess my, where, where I'm going with this is that I think a lot of it, there's some people, you know, we're just not gonna convert, but I think there are places where we can make progress, build the trust, provide some examples, educate people on how these systems work, and then eventually bring them around, or at least be able to make some progress in having, having some conversations and, and getting some change underway. So thanks. Like any good question, the answer to that is it depends. <laughs> so uh, not, not to be flippant, but uh, it, it, it does depend on the, on the situation. I mean, um, natural disasters are a part of the world we live in. It is a dangerous world. We've, you know, we've always had floods and droughts and earthquakes and, and uh, catastrophic uh, ice melting and so forth. However, um, at minimum, climate change is changing the way in which those things happen, um, in and sometimes in subtle ways, uh, in it's in, it's changing the frequencies of certain kinds of events. It's increasing the frequencies of certain kinds of events. It's decreasing uh, others. But it's basically the world that that. Uh, natural resource managers, forest managers, fire managers, water managers, um, civil engineers, uh, transportation managers, the world that they have been working within and the assumptions they've been making about the range of environmental variability that they have to prepare for um, and the stationarity, stationarity of that variability, that's breaking down and things are changing. And so we're having to re-engineer a lot of our infrastructure and re-engineer a lot of our management practices. And uh, that includes the, the, the hazard uh, domain. So certain kinds of hazards are certainly changing. Uh, if you, uh, you know, with sea level rise, if you've got a house that's here and you raise the sea level by a centimeter and then put a big storm in there that might happen every, 15 years, just that centimeter is maybe enough to take your, your property out. So the, the risks are changing uh, because of that. Um, there are definitely some hazards that are, that are increasing, um, but there are others that are you know, just, just changing. I'm, I'm a little, because I'm not a, a climatologist per se, uh, I don't wanna make strong assertions. You know, certainly we're seeing things changing in the hurricane sphere. There's still some controversy over how much, or disagreement, let's say, within the scientific community over how much of that is climate change, but certainly sea level rise is not helping the situation. You know, another one that I was just reading about last night is uh, tornado frequencies or tornado behavior in the US is changing so that we're actually seeing, over the past 30 years, we're seeing fewer days with tornadoes but on days that there are tornadoes, there are a lot of them. So again, things are happening that are just changing the way that that, that happens. And you know, again, if you're if you're a risk manager dealing with tornadoes, that's a really big difference. Having you know 
a tornado here, a tornado there every few days versus having a cluster of tornadoes concentrated in an area in a, in a short period of time, followed by a couple of weeks of nothing, you know, that, that's a very, very big difference. Um, and so one of the ways I, uh, that, that uh, again, I'm, uh, with, with climate change, because we are changing things rapidly and we don't know yet, you know, we're not going to know until we've got some years behind us uh, to where we can look back statistically. But, um, you know, we are changing the behavior a lot of, these, of a lot of these kinds of systems, and we're going outside the boundaries of our societal um, experience. And that's, that's right there. That's, a, that's an increase in risk. So... So just for the for the sake of time, uh, why don't we wind things down? Although I'm sure Dr. Jackson will be happy to stick around to answer questions that uh, members of the audience have. Uh, this has been a, a fantastic presentation, and you know, looking at this through the lens of people who are in healthcare, um, you know, it's clear that climate change is going to have a human impact. You you've spoken very eloquently about how complicated that will be, but it also occurs to me. Uh, that not everybody is going to be affected the same. And part of that will be by where you are and part of that will be by who you are. Um, we, we could not have asked for a, a better presentation for this lecture series. So Dr. Jackson, thank you very much. I wanna thank the I want to thank all of you for coming. I want to thank the Sandors for uh, sponsoring this lecture series. Uh, this uh, is going to have a substantial impact. Um, and thank you all for coming. Have a good evening. <laughs>